Thank you so much for joining the November uh, Design Speaker Series Dropbox. Looks like we have a handful of folks joining from throughout the world, so that's amazing. Today we have the wonderful Ana Areola Canada, uh, a Seasons uh, thought leader, designer, innovator, craftsperson uh, joining us. And we're going to talk a little bit about design leadership and, and uh, innovation and vulnerability and just hear a little bit about Anna's experience and, and her perspective in the space. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn over to, to Anna to introduce herself and talk a little bit about her experience. And, and uh, after that, we'll have a little bit of a fireside chat. If you have any questions along the way, please be sure to use the Q&A panel. I'll be keeping an eye on questions there and, and we'll bring those in towards the end. So welcome, Anna. Thank you for having me, Nicole. Um, hey, everyone. It's so great to see so many of you uh, from around the world uh, now joining uh, this, this, this fireside chat. Uh, thanks again to Dropbox team for having me. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and also, I was so happy to hear you all are playing my favorite artist, eBay. So really happy to kick off the event uh, with their wonderful tunes. Um, you know, it's it's interesting doing these sorts of discussions because, you know, believe it or not, I'm an extreme introvert, um, but I can harness the energy on days like today and kind of like force me towards the middle of the spectrum, which is like being an ambivert. Um, I really adore boring things. I just want to get that out there right away with everyone. Um, but happy to be here with all of you. I'm Anna. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and she, her, hers. Uh, I'm a Scorpio. Uh, my moon is Gemini and I'm an Aries rising and uh, tomorrow's my birthday. So it's really fun to be doing this on the day right before my birthday. Yay! A <laughs> um, little bit about me. Um, so I am living up here in the Pacific Northwest, but I share space between the Pacific Northwest um, and Tokyo, as well as Northern California. Um, I am a mother of three. Uh, I have an 18 year old, a 16 year old, an 11 year old. My oldest just now left to go to college, uh, but is doing this first term remotely to the University of Doshisha in Kyoto. Um, um, my middle daughter uh, is going to be focusing on humid. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that term. It's not the traditional uh, medical sort of uh, studies. It's the intersections of humanity and medicine. Um, really returning to old school bedside manner, sort of high touch white glove care that we so need right now in these desperate times of COVID. And my littlest one, uh, Koji, uh, really is into this llama game on PlayStation. It's called Rocket League. And there's this llama rama mode that they're just totally enamored with. Um, these are my three kids, uh, Koji, Emmy, and Maya. And just so you can learn a little bit about me. Uh, my energy. I am a second generation immigrant. I'm Latinx. Uh, I was uh, born in Los Angeles, uh, but a third culture kid having lived all around the world. Um, I'm a queer lesbian woman of trans and non-binary experience. Uh, my lovely wife Megumi and I, we live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and bringing it all back to where I first started uh, uh, as my place on this world, I was born in uh, Hollywood uh, in Los Angeles where shortly moved over to the hills, uh, to the valley, uh, where I uh, went to school up until high school in North Hollywood. Um, I entered design when I left high school and I moved to Japan. Um, and I didn't go to the traditional areas that most people find themselves, which is essentially like Osaka or Tokyo or, or even Kyoto. Um, I ended up going to a pretty obscure Japan seaside town that is now very famous. It's called Kanazawa. And Kanazawa is also known as the sister city of Kyoto. Um, they're, they're very much rivals between the crafts, uh, craftsperson movement that's happening right now. Um, and through the course of my career, uh, even until today, I'm executing product design uh, throughout Kyoto, Tokyo, Northern California, and Pacific Northwest. I have my own side activities, um, keeping that hustle alive, uh, now exploring some new opportunities uh, with my wife, uh, Megumi. Uh, as well as I am like trying to help better the world with the activities that I'm doing here at Microsoft. Um, I really like want to share with everyone that like everything I'm going to be talking about today and my own personal values, I really hold true uh, to what I consider to be my three core values. Um, that not only do I execute in my discipline amongst product design and research, but I also hold true in my life. Um, it's something that I really live by. 
And that's human, simple, and authentic. I believe that all interactions should be innately humanistic, literally like you're designing utensils. You know, the most intimate product anyone can design is that of a utensil, uh, a piece of silverware that you will be putting inside of your body, your mouth, um, and that the interactions, the affordances that we create should just be inherently innate, easy to understand without any explanation, delightful, and just being able to jump and get going and start using. From a simple perspective, I'm a huge believer in minimalism, um, but, I, but I believe that it, it's not being completely minimalistic, but it's decomposing an experience or a product, re reducing it being redactive to the point where it breaks, and then being incredibly ruthless with selectivity of what you're adding into those experiences, making it incredibly simplistic. And then authenticity, being authentic. You know, not all of us can always have the great idea, that sort of catalytic moment that we're like, aha, let's do that. Rather, we should always be open to the influence of being wowed and being delighted by other people and other creatives that are doing amazing work, which so many of you are around the planet. And it's through that, that sort of, um, I guess, acknowledgement of like being inspired by, but then using your lens, your life lens to pivot that and, and sort of have your own authentic perspective on it. I think that's really powerful. Um, the course of my career, I've, I've worked across various uh, aspects of the product design and research discipline where like working in disruption and innovation to like traditional design thinking, um, to like co CMF, color material and finishing, industrial design, I've led ID as well as mechanical and electrical engineering teams and software engineering teams. And I've also been a product manager as well. So I harness all that together in my day-to-day -day practices. And I really do encourage my teams that I build and that I work with on a daily basis to be able to swap their hats, you know, you, you know, where needed, put your product manager hat on, where needed, put your technologist hat on, where needed, put your, your UX researcher hat on, um, and vice versa uh, with product design. Um, I've, you know, as a craftswoman in product design and research, uh, and having had a great fortune to have worked across the valley and the world uh, with Microsoft, Facebook, PlayStation, Samsung, Adobe, and Apple, but also having my own hardware uh, startups that I founded, um, you know, I've been very grateful to have explored solutions to solve real world problems and serve the world by exploring ethical opportunities at these intersections of humanity, technology, and design. Um, so it's been a pretty interesting, colorful life journey. I even were, have worked in the animation industry. Like while I was in high school, I was interning on The Simpsons, seasons three and four at Film Roman. Found my way into the Japanese animation industry for a little bit. Uh, did voice acting in the Japanese animation industry for a little bit. If any of you have Netflix, uh, check out Evangelion. If you haven't seen Neon Genesis Evangelion, episode 18. Uh, turn the Japanese original audio track on in the first five minutes of it, you'll, you'll hear my voice as one of the military pilots flying in the Black Heavy unit. Um, that was a total lost in translation movie moment where it was like nine hours of my life lost, repeating, trying to be asked to be more passionate. I never want to do that again. <laughs> Thus, I'm in this industry now. Um, and it's with everything that I do. Um, not only am I doing it for my kids, but I'm doing it for the future generation of our planet. It's the, it's the youngest of the Gen Zs that are now working in the workforce. And most of all, it's for the alphas. It's, it's, for, the, it's for this generation that's under 10 years old and that will be born for the next six years ongoing. We need to be thinking about this as craftspeople. Uh, how are we gonna bring warming, engaging, delightful, and welcoming and inclusive experiences into this world? And that's a little bit about me and my background. So I'll hand it over to you, Nick, Nicole. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anna. That was great. Um, so that's a, a really great segue to the first question that I have. <laughs> so you talk about um, authentic and simple and human. And I'm curious, how does empathy come into play when you are um, looking at like co-creation, uh, co creation, innovation? I think having empathy is having understanding of you know ideally first like our own feelings uh feelings of others that are around us and the feelings of the constituents and the wonderful people of the world that we create um, our product and services and our platform experiences for um i think that 
if you think about how empathy leads into driving innovation, uh, pushing towards human centered needs, um, you know, one of the things as a leader, you need to make sure uh, that you create that space and you're empowered by your leadership and your company to really invest in having a diverse team and yourself need to have that diverse perspective as well. Um, it's this representation that immensely contributes to the business, to people's insights and innovation. Um, uh, one of the things I think that's really important uh, to further grow and continue to nurture and invest into one's empathy and the empathy of your team is to deeply understand, monitor the sociocultural trends that are happening throughout our world. Um, we need to get out of our, our microchasm, right? The, the, either it's the Valley, it's Silicon Alley, it's, it's the UK, it's, you know, or it, it's the Pacific Northwest. We need to get out of this North American Western myopic bubble and get our minds and our spirits and our hearts into the field. We need to be doing a lot more in-field research uh, with our teams, whether you're personal, like if you're a product designer, put your researcher hat on. If you're a UX researcher, put your product designer hat on. Get into the field with your engineering, your data science partners. And it's it's getting into the field and having that, that in real life experience. And, and in these times of COVID, this remote experience where we can really focus on understanding what's happening in the communities around the areas of the world and the markets that we're trying to grow and we're trying to move into. Um, thinking about how you can also fold into not only your own lived experiences through this research, but like invest in or try to get the funds from your company to allow you to subscribe and create primary and secondary syndicated research. Um, like subscribe or, or, or try to find ways to get access to these services. It's, it's this deep understanding through empathy that will help us understand the future generation's needs. Um, you know, just really quickly talk about that future generation if it's okay. Um, Gen Z and the alpha population, you know, tracking their population growth, really the majority of, of these constituents are outside of the Western world. The future growth of this planet is happening across Nigeria and Kenya and South Africa and Bangladesh and India and Indonesia. Um, and it's like the support that we need to give that I'm giving my teams uh, that hopefully will help them better understand their points of views to be more informed in their exploration and the needs that they want. You know, that will allow us to create these delightful experiences um, to understand how we want to craft those outcomes and spending our focused energy. Um, that's something I think that can really help sort of embolden us to be more empathetic, to be more kind to those that we're creating for and ourselves as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, love hearing discussion around field research and, and kind of getting out there and, and really connecting with, with humans, right? That's, that's how you make a human. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious uh, uh, to sort of step sideways a little bit. Um, getting outside your own your own your own space in the world and learning about other people also requires um, some vulnerability, right? Some. Uh, I, I'm I'm curious how that's come to play within your life, uh, expressing leveraging vulnerability. Yeah. Um... Thinking about being vulnerable and thinking about vulnerability and trying to harness that and ideally making that your own and others superpowers right. Um, I think that if you can be vulnerable in, in the experiences that you create I, I quickly skipped over that slide that was there a second ago. Um, th th this is a photograph of me doing in field ethnographic research on my last hardware startup It was around present mindful smartphone. And I was in Kyoto and talking about being vulnerable. It's like taking something that is really technologically barely working, cobbled together, but it's in a package that it's ready to show people and like walking up to people, being vulnerable to like say, excuse me, um, can I have a conversation with you? Can I show you something? Uh, and then putting that in their hands and seeing how they react. The, 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 the emotional response that you see them give and that you receive from that is pretty, pretty growing uh, for oneself uh, and the product uh, sort of direction that you can be taking with it. And, and I think being vulnerable um, is really important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, investing in teams wellness uh, is really critical uh, to allowing for that vulnerability. Uh, you know, the team's wellness allows for safety and it creates a space for belonging. 
Um, and by, by having that, this allows individuals to be vulnerable with themselves and others to share and discuss far out ideas. Here I am sharing a far out idea with these two individuals. Um, and I think that like having that ability to, to make yourself and others vulnerable will allow you to really have discussions and debates, like really beautiful creative debates around these ideas that, that eventually become catalytic in nature and, and, and transition into to being superpowers. Um, so I think that is really critical to, to really having that vulnerability. Um, something else I wanna talk about as it relates to vulnerability, um, and that is where we are right now within a craft, um, um, as we're executing against, you know, whether they're native applications and services, whether we're creating hardware and creating platforms that will run across all of the before mentioned, it's the impact that AI is having. We need ourselves to be vulnerable, to ask scary questions, to be open to hearing frightening and scary answers with the intent to steward where this possible future uh, is going. Because like, if we don't involve ourselves, if we don't insert ourselves in creating this vulnerability, um, that starts with having that team wellness and creating that space of belonging. We can apply that into the products and experiences that we create. Um, something I'd also like to encourage everyone to be a little bit more open with a growth mindset is keeping top of mind, understanding what the social technical understanding is in the work that we do and its intent. Understanding that with this growth mindset, we need to now think about outside of the traditional protected, playful, creative boundaries that we live within, but really try to push our minds and our knowledge into areas that are maybe really scary and that's of machine learning and reinforcement learning. It's, and we need to understand this ourselves and our communities can debunk the myths around what it truly means to be vulnerable in a time of responsible AI and responsible co-creation as designers and researchers. You know, areas of critical understanding, uh, in particular, the biases that exhibit themselves uh, in these models and data sets. Um, you know, that's something we really need to dive into. And, and just one thing I want to leave everyone with, if you're working in this space, you really need to push your teams and your leadership to make sure that they're using the right uh, training methodologies for this new discipline that you need to be vulnerable and grow into. Um, so often I've seen these failures occur based by human decisions and leadership decisions that have been made in the development process that might include using services like Amazon's Mechanical Turk or consultants or individuals that don't have that, that North Star of eth efficacy and, and how they're basically contributing and building up these models. Um, that often introduces harm into the models and data sets that they create. And it's us and our teams that need to think about the benefits and harms to ensure that we're making the right trade-offs. Understanding these models and data sets and their limitations will only help us build more usable and, and better well-crafted and protected data sets um, for the future. Yeah, um, that's great, very, very, amazing deep thoughts on our, our impact, right? As, as creators, <laughs> um, we do need to think about, they are, they are important. Yeah, to, to be aware of what we're contributing to, we're building and, and our, the impact, yeah. Uh, how about failure? Now you talk about like, what's, what's, what's been important, right? <laughs> like, yeah. so there's, there's failure and there's, there's, uh, you know, courage and failure. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about like, what, are there any sort of um, awesome ways in which you failed in the past and, and how does, how have you leveraged that for like building up your courage and, and learning? Failure, um, being a mother, I'm trying to teach that to my kids right now, right? So like, so often I think parenting, um, for those of you that have little ones, um, or for those of you that are like really sort of shepherding your teams as well, you need to allow for failure to happen and failure for my own life. It's like, you know, while we've all had experiences and products that we've created that have not lived up to our own intent or, or, or sort of um, possibility, we need to learn from these failures. And it's through this hard falling and deeply understanding that we have the ability to be mindful about the moment, right? Pause, zoom out and reflect. 
Um, and I think that's the number one thing that as it relates to failures that we can all learn from. Um, some of you know, and some of you may not know about one of the critical failures, failures that my team and I had after we left Apple um, and we went to dive into the world of biotechnology. Uh, and uh, there's a book and there's a forthcoming movie um, about our experience, it's called Bad Blood. And it was the journey at Theranos essentially um, that we lived, uh, and those of you that have access to the audiobook or the, or the printed book, if you look at chapters three and four, you'll read about our failures and our experiences and, and, and the, the instances of which we, we faced at that time. And I think that like when this happened, it was so traumatic. It was such a traumatic failure on many different fronts that it took most of us 13 years to process. Uh, and, and hours and hours, a decade of therapy uh, to live through. Um, but it allowed us to have that insight so that in the event that situations like this happen in the future as well, we can make informed decisions, uh, whether it be product feature refinements, whether it be a career path that we may want to have an intersection at and have a critical conversation with ourselves and say like, is this the right journey that I want to be on? Like there's so many other opportunities out there. Let's 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 hang a 90 degree turn and let's pivot. Let, let's let's go off in a different direction. Um, so I think that that's really important, uh, and that's something we can all learn from failures. Um, yeah, I, I think the key thing is is like doing your own post mortem uh, at, at any given point. If you're in a team and you're building a product or a service or a platform or a piece of hardware, it's like have that introspection moment where you gather all the designated responsible individuals into a room and openly discuss, not blame one another if something failed, but say, yes, and how could we, how might we have done X, Y, and Z better or like to learn at the next, the next ideation or the next opportunity. That's that, that would be my, my, my highly recommended sort of share out to everyone uh, on how best to handle that. Yeah, great. And, and as I'm curious about uh, any, any advice for leaders in helping their teams feel um, like they have permission to fail up front? Um, I think that leaders, um, those that are managing people, those that are leads on projects, uh, and and leaders that are that are leading organizations, making sure that your leadership, your executive management. Um, will ensure the team's protected wellness that you yourselves will like invest in the wellness of your team. Um, that's really important. And you do that by setting hard boundaries, um, by having that conversation with your team, with, with people you collaborate with on an XFN cross-functional basis, that for yourselves and your business partners, your collaborators, like setting those boundaries really teaches them uh, as well as shows by example that you need to basically have hard stops and that's to protect your own wellness that's to protect your team's wellness that's to protect you know, the investment in your own creative growth and exploration um uh, and making sure you block that out you have those conversations but you block that out in your calendar throughout the day like something i do um, every day, I try to as much as possible. I'm pretty good at it, uh, but I try to block out uh, a, a pretty important time in which I personally can sort of re-harness my own energy, my creative thinking, uh, have a chance to provide that space where I can like have that far out thinking and reflection. And I do that by every late afternoon going swimming. Um, and, it's, and it's like making sure that I can protect those boundaries where I can actually get off uh, out to the gym in a safe COVID fashion where you can reserve a lean and, you know, apparently pool chlorine and acid kills COVID. But uh, um, unfortunately yesterday to be transparent and vulnerable, I, I didn't protect that boundary, but I, but I, but I allowed that, that wavering instance because we, we had this last minute request. Um, I'm on this AI ethics uh, cross-functional team inside of Microsoft called Aether and Aura, the Office of Responsible AI. And, and my co-chair, Salima, um, asked last minute, who's also a parent with a newborn, if I could step in and, and sort of speak on behalf of her at the uh, machine learning and data science conference internally, MLADS. And I was like, absolutely. You know, there are times where we have to make room for that because we're supporting others, right? And I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
we, we actually have a question very related to this, this, uh, this dialogue. So I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and ask it now rather than later. So I have um, Hannah asking, what is a heart boundary? And can you give a specific example? Um, the, the swimming example is an example of a hard boundary. It's like, you need that to satiate yeah. yourself creatively and, and, and holistically, and, and you yeah. just make it unwavering. You don't move it. Another example of a hard boundary is how someone communicates with you or your team. It's like making sure that to be uh, protective and create that space of belonging and wellness, like you can have people that are aggressive, whether it's through microaggressions, whether it's through verbal aggressions, because any form of aggression is abuse. Um, and I think you setting those hard boundaries with your leadership, your cross-functional people is really important. Um, there's, there's a couple of good books that I could, that I could recommend about having those types of boundary conversations. Uh, one is, and a lot of people that know me are sick of hearing this, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it, it's Kim Scott's uh, Radical Candor. And another book, and that's for giving candid feedback. It was a highly recommended read when I was at Facebook. Um, and then I, I, I've also realized that there's a lot of people that are so often easily able to give feedback, but they can't receive feedback. And so another great book is Thanks for the Feedback um, that I think is really important. Um, that's how uh, Hannah, I would believe, setting those boundaries would be really very beneficial. Um, Rachel, uh, thanks for the huge shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Radical Candor is also uh, re reading that uh, this is some Wiley at Dropbox. <laughs> so awesome. It's a great book. I can endorse it as well. It's it's important to know how and when to be candid and speak openly in a respectful way, right? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so uh, maybe we can switch gears a little bit uh, to innovation. Sure. So. So it sounds like you spend a lot of time in the innovative space, <laughs> sort of an understatement. Uh, how how might the mindset for innovation be a little bit different than than iterative? Yeah. Um, so my journey, as I mentioned, I've had the great fortune to have worked on some some interesting stuff, stuff that I'm happy about, stuff now in hindsight I'm regretful about. And let me just first start with the original iPhone. Um, when our team was building UI kit, core animation, you know, the core UX layer for the device, you know, we were trying to make the best desktop web experience where our main focus was, can we read the New York Times in full fidelity on a small screen, which at that time wasn't capable of doing if you had a Nokia or a Sony Ericsson device that was running the proprietary um, Series 60 or Symbian operating systems. And, and, and we did it, but like you, you now, in 2020, 2021, we now have the, the, the ramifications of that decision, which at the time seemed great and the world loved it and you all love it still today, but it's also attack on human cognition, right? The notifications, the constantly looking at your phone when you're sharing, you know, shared love time with your loved one or your children, either you or your kids or your loved one are, are have their faces in their phones, right? That's an area of like, like in hindsight, you need to think about all the, all the ways of which innovation can go sideways. Um, and I, none of us knew that at the time, right? Um, you know, you think about like another aspect of that is like when like our team were working on that, we were really looking to make sure that the open web succeeded because in that period, flash was still a predominant sort of expression of creativity and the investment we made into WebKit really ensured thinking about innovation as the future, driving and backing open standards, open web standards, being invested in and being part of the CSS working groups, you know, the W3C, the what application working group it is another area. Um, that's one way you can harness innovation is trying to apply that, that lens or the crystal ball to think to the future of the thing that you're working on. Um, something of late uh, would be the work that my team and I did when we were designing the frame television at Samsung. It's like, you know, you 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 have usually this like I love using chef metaphors too, like uh, mise en place uh, or mise en place. Uh, you have a series of pre-prepared ingredients of which a chef can make anything out of, right? And so in Samsung's case, when we're working on the frame, we had seen the work that our team had done on Serif. That we had seen the team the work that our team had been doing with screens and where the Q series was going and a bunch of different sensors. But then we got a, into a discussion with the the mechanical and software. 
uh, engineers and said like, what if we did this and that? What if we had the ability to understand light sensitivity that was coming in and reflect that um, in the luminance of the screen? And, and, and how can we mimic natural media, paper, make paper look like real paper and see paper fibers to utilize the 4K resolution of that screen or to, to make a photograph look like a real photograph or architectural drawings look like architectural drawings. Um, and that led to thinking with co-creation with a futurist, uh, Cameron, who now is a futurist at Amazon, like how can we bring an art platform? How can you, if we have the screen that takes up, you know, the majority of spaces on our walls and our homes that's traditionally off as a black rectangle, how can we add an art service to it so we can have low energy artwork and introduce this art service into everyone's lives? And that's another area of like innovation and how we applied that, uh, thinking of like looking at Art Basel, how can we bring Art Basel into everyone's homes? Um, and I think it's like, no matter what you're working on, whether it's an application that resides on multiple different devices, if it's a service, if it's a business or enterprise experience, you need to understand what is possible today. And you can only understand that by deeply partnering with your engineering and your product partners and understanding the limitations of the platform and then pushing them and learning yourself about the technologies or the frameworks that you're using or the capabilities of the hardware in, in, in the cloud um, at, at, at that service center or on device. So you can then start planning what is the 18 to 24 month roadmap for, roadmap for that look like the near term and the long term future. That's how you drive innovation. Awesome. Um, I think that it's a good time to maybe switch over. We have a, a few questions in our Q and A. Uh, yeah. Okay. So first one, uh, I'm a sophomore at liberal arts college. This is Jenna studying computer science, philosophy, and economics. Do you have any advice on how I can maximize my college experience and get started if I'm aspiring to work in tech? I think, again, these are my own, um, my own thoughts. They do not reflect uh, partners I work with or employers that I may be presently employed at. So I'm just putting that out there. But, but the advice I have is, you know, if, if you're too focused on a hard science, those hard skills, whether it's comp sci, whether it's design even, um, you're going to have a hard time being that multidisciplinary individual. And I think that for those of you that are still in school, spend the time to dive deeper into the liberal arts, spend the time to learn more about psychology and creative thinking and creative writing, having that well rounded soft and hard skill uh, capability and be able to shine through in your virtual interview that is now part of the normal weird world we live in with COVID like thanks zoom thanks Microsoft teams. Thanks Google Meet. Um, it's going to be really helpful. Um, and be sure you you list that as a core strength. You know, when you construct your resume and you build your portfolio out, and you have your superpowers listed ideally at the top underneath your name, like be sure you you have those soft skills that are very valuable um, listed there. Uh, and it, like when you're applying for a job, read the job description, understand where it might not be explicitly saying that that cross-functional ability, the capability of deeply understanding and listening and having that growth mindset and being empathetic, be sure those are, are integrated into your holistic package. Hope that helps. Well put. Okay, um, let's see, Alyssa is curious, do you have, oops. Um, do you have any advice on how do you find teams that really believe in or practice these core concepts rather than claim to? I feel like these concepts trendy and companies claim to be putting in this work, but lots don't necessarily. How do we find companies whose norms align with our core values? Yeah, um, I think more than ever in the last two to three years, like having a working for um, and really, like I would even I would flip working for for uh, and changing that sort of description to like you know helping in in, in collaboration with right because like we really should be like in love with what we do like our work should be our hobby and our passion um, and not something that we just need to show up for and by do by understanding that first and foremost that allows us to look at and select the type of organization we want to be with um, and one way you can do that is by 
listening to their 10K result earnings uh, uh, broadcasts. You know, it sounds really nerdy, but like if you get in and you listen to the CFOs of these companies and you can really understand what, what monetarily is driving the mo modes and methodologies for what they're creating. And, and you can hear from the business side why they're doing what they're doing. And often if you can hear them talk about ethics, if you hear them have like their chief legal officer or their CEO come in and talk about the importance of efficacy, and, and the impact of which they're having in their, with their constituents and, and the users of their experiences around the world, that'll help you sort of hone on, is this the right company I wanna basically invest my love and my passion and my time with? Um, that's really important. Um, so aside from the 10K reports, I think you could also do some digging. Um, if it's a smaller, like less than a Fortune 100, 500 size company, somebody that may be smaller uh, and not publicly traded, um, it's by going to a site like Crunchbase and like looking at the company and understanding, okay, said company that looks really interesting. It's got a role I want to apply for. I want to work at this company, but who are their leaders? You could look at their leaders. You could do your own sort of, you know, social engineering and research on who these people are by searching them on the web. Um, you could also, what's really important is find out who their, who their funders are, who's, who's investing in them. Is it A16? Is it, you know, like, like said given venture capital and understand who are the leaders at that VC firm and read and watch some of their videos to get a sense of, are they ethical? Or are they purely like overtly, you know, capitalistic and they want to basically just suck the energy and money out of something that, that probably may not be a company you want to work for. Uh, you definitely don't want to be involved in it in sort of a culture like that. So um, that's one way you can really take a look at uh, to understand fundamentally, is this company good or evil? Um, that would be some of the advice I'd have. Awesome. Okay, let's see, we have Leon. Um, he's asking, can you talk to some ML examples and how it's being used to inform improvements in service interaction and human, humanization beyond simple quick web flow optimization? So to unpack that question, how is machine learning being utilized beyond like a search engine, essentially, I, I'm guessing. Um, I, I think uh, from a from an ethical and creative perspective, I'll share with you uh, kind of an interesting exploration that uh, my team, while I was at Facebook, we did. We, we, we partnered with a leading French fashion designer. Uh, I'll just leave, leave them uh, nameless for the time being. And we were exploring uh, adversarial network uh, machine learning. And so we were, which GAN, uh, general, ge uh, general adversarial network learning and understanding where you feed it a bunch of stuff and it comes back with stuff. And if you do that in a creative fashion, creative adversarial um, learning, you can do interesting things. Ideally, you can design products with it. And so one way we were using that was like to take, uh, uh, ingest a bunch of assets from said given company in France and outputted output um, uh, beautiful examples of creative art that were then shown and, and made commercially available. That's one aspect of how you could use it. Um, you could also use it uh, for good. Some of the work that we're using it for in Microsoft, we, we have um, the ability to like really sort of learn and sort of make uh, affordances that are going to be in service of protecting minority uh, represented communities and being much more like friendly through how we might address someone uh, in Word or Outlook. So like as you're typing, we've got grammar and spell check, but we also have like sort of mood and sensitivity and sort of friendliness now that we're looking at. Um, in the very near future, you're going to be able to make sure that you don't misgender someone with proper pronoun correction and sort of relearning of that. So that's something I'm really excited about that's forthcoming. Um, you know, the work, many teams are working on that. Uh, it is an initiative that John Friedman and I really sort of pushed forward with when I first joined Microsoft. And it's nice to see the progress that that's coming along. Um, other areas might be how using machine learning to understand information, right? These, these data sets and models and, and us as designers finding unique ways to make sure that the visualization, the infographic aspects of that are accessible, that they're not just made for data scientists or engineers or business leaders, but they're like anyone who is a marketer or creative individual can glean insights and make the right uh, sort of assumptions and decisions 
having, having that sort of beautifully designed and curated and brought back to them. That's an area that uh, my team and I are currently looking at. Um, there's a lot of work and innovation that can still happen there. But um, I think machine learning is not a, cap, a stop gap. It, it can't solve everything. It could usually solve something very vertically deep uh, and do it well. But I think all of us have to be accountable to helping push that, that technological discipline and move it horizontally as well so that we create this glowing inclusivity halo around the machine learning technologies that are out there. That's the responsible AI thinking that we all need to uh, uh, follow through. And then there's lots of interesting things that are out there. So there's some resources that our Aether team have created, guidelines for human interaction. So there are PDFs that you could basically download off of our site or Microsoft Research site that have access to all these cards. Um, if you were lucky enough to attend IXDA, uh, it seems like a, a lifetime ago, but I guess it was when it was here in Seattle, like two years ago, um, the team in Society and Ethics, Mira's team and Josh Lovejoy created Judgment Call, which is a great, a great sort of responsible AI ethical card set game. Um, but then you have other people that like know how important this is. And uh, Leslie Ann Noel uh, created probably one of my favorite sets so far, the designer's critical alphabet for machine learning and sort of uh, accountable and, and ethical sort of design practices and principles. Um, this is a card set you can get off of their Instagram site. I think it's sold on Etsy. Um, but more stuff like this is coming out. There are more books coming out about this. Uh, uh, Design Justice by Sasha at, at MIT, Algorithms of Oppression by Safia Noble, uh, Dr. Safia Noble at UCLA. There's just so many resources that you, again, having that growth mindset, learning, digging up, exploring, finding, and sharing is the way that we could sort of push this, this, this discipline further. Oh, fantastic. Uh, okay, so next question. How do you prevent dark designs in your work now that you have so much experience in hindsight? Dark designs, like evil design, mm -hmm. like designing for not, sorry. <laughs> that question <laughs> me up hard. Like dark to not question. destroy the world? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, well, it takes um, making sure you recruit and you bring on the right people into your team. Um, um, now, if any of you have like, uh, folks that are that, that are having evil thoughts or, or are trying to push you know this work and this practice into unethical areas I encourage all of you to have that critical conversation with your HR business partners <laughs> um, you know in in confidence and and, and, and confidentially uh, because th that is I believe unacceptable no matter what company you're at um, and if you are working at a company that is currently doing that um, you have to make that judgment call Right. If you're working at Palantir, are you doing service for good or service for evil? Are you hurting marginalized populations or are you ensuring their visibility? Uh, uh, you have to make those calls if you want to stay or leave. Um, yeah, it's an individual decision. There's not necessarily any yeah. guidance uh, I, I can give you there, but it's a personal call. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of wonder if this question is associated to the previous one, right? It's sort of like, how do you educate yourself to ensure that you're using IA and ML appropriately? So, um, you know, I, I think the best thing to do is to go off and buy those two books, right? Um, Algorithms of Oppression and Design Justice. And Design Justice is actually an, an, an encapsulment of like Algorithm of Oppression plus Alpha. Um, and that'll give you a huge primer uh, on like a variety of different directions and additional resources you can go off to and, and self-learn about. Um, I think also, and now this may be super nerdy, not for all, at least give it a try, um, but attend some of the conferences that are specifically for machine learning that are traditionally, you know, um, visited by the academia, the science and academics uh, of the world. Uh, and that might include NERPS, um, ICANN, iClear. Those are the top three, I think, for computer vision, all up sort of neuroscience and computer science. I think those are really good. Those three conferences are probably the best you should attend. Yeah, so it's probably a little a little more along the lines of maybe don't not not actively trying to prevent but creating that awareness right within yeah it, it's it, it, you. and I think if you want to slowly wade into those waters like you don't want to jump into that sort of Icelandic super cold ocean you could start by yeah. simply going to like SIGGRAPH. SIGGRAPH 
is um, kind of like that that step between like IXDA and NERPS. Uh, if you go to SIGGRAPH, it's a good overmix of now machine learning and computer science and human interaction on um, uh, human-centered design. So that would be a good starting point if any of you have not attended SIGGRAPH. I have a, a comment here, a, clear, a question for clarification to repeat those three sources again. So it's well, NERPS, I -E -R. Um, uh, and iClear. Yeah, these, these are acronyms. If you do a search, you'll get the full acronym explanation for it. Uh, and it covers computer vision, natural language and speech processing in general, like where the industry as a whole all up is going, especially within the future of AI, like reinforcement learning, deep learning and artificial general intelligence, AGI. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, we'll switch gears again a little bit. Um, so Hope we have, that, huh? um, <laughs> yeah. Old Adobe uh, friend. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in professional life, how have you been clear about what you want to work on and how has serendipity opened unexpected oh, yeah, doors and opportunities that got uh, you where you are today? Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's quickly jump back. Let's see if we can go back a couple slides and um, I'll talk a little bit about how I believe both intent and serendipity played into that journey of mine. Um, so, okay, great, that's, that, that's the slide. Um, initially, when I started off with my career, I wanted to be in the animation industry. I wanted, I had lots of friends that were working at Disney feature animation. This is right when like Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid and mm, the Tezuka Osamu unauthentically inspired ripped off uh, movie The Lion King <laughs> happened. I said I wanted to work for those companies, and and when I got there, I realized that now I really wanted to like do more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to move to Japan. So I think that that that's an inflection point in one's career where you look at where you are and you're like, is this really? Am I happy? Do I want to be here? And you just got to make that happen. So then I jumped, right? And, and when I was in Japan, I it was at the intersection of. Um, and if any of you have not seen this amazing series that you all should binge watch, it's Halt and Catch Fire. Um, that'll give you an explanation of the industry, pre-industry as it is now uh, at the intersection of the first, you know, personal computer to like search engine to the browser wars, i.e. Netscape. Um, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One, the journey I'm about to explain, but then also is beautifully designed and award-winning opening motion graphics title sequence by Elastic. Uh, definitely check that out and check out Elastic's uh, work on it. But um, I, I ended up finding my way out of animation uh, and falling into product design. And originally at Macromedia, I was one of the original founding members of Macromedia Japan. And we were working on director back in that day, back in that time that led eventually into like deeply collaborating with Kevin Lynch, who's now at Apple on creating Dreamweaver and whatnot. And uh, it was like falling into that, realizing that this is cool. We're like doing interaction design now, product design, creating features, building features. But then it was at that point where I, it clicked that it's really important to be designing things that people want and that people need. And through a series of stumbles, like falling out of Macromedia into meta design, learning from Eric Speakerman and Bill Hill and Terry Irwin that's at uh, CMU right now, and Kevin Farnham that founded Method, like working with that crew, Patrick Corrigan, who's at Airlift right now, that led me into Adobe where really Adobe grounded me. And in that time I was with Adobe and deeply understanding like consumer advisory boards, uh, getting feedback from around the world, going off and going embedding yourself in field and learning and talking to people at Starbucks and at, at cafes and, and agencies and companies to like further build and explore those professions. So. What I'm trying to say here is like, you know, push yourself to learn how you can either in, inherently take on that culture and learn and grow from that or, or basically teach that company you're with. Um, and I'd say that's true for the rest of the journey, right? I'm, I'm always being additive. So when I was at Adobe, I wanted to work on operating systems uh, and hardware. So I went to Apple, but Apple only afforded me the opportunity to work on the operating system. And I wanted to have hardware in you know, industrial design and UX. And that allowed me to say, my next move is Theranos. And when I got to Theranos, I mean, read the book. I don't want to go into the trauma there. 
um, I said I wanted to do more and I ended up going to Sony and PlayStation. And then it's additive, right? I want to learn game, game creation and game design and work on that. Then I said I wanted to create my own hardware company. So I left with some ex-Sony executives and we created my first hardware startup. Um, that failed. I, I learned from that failure. I pivoted and created my second hardware startup, which was a semi-success. Uh, but then I wanted to get into understanding how do I build chips? You know, Qualcomm level sort of system on a chip exploration. That's when I went to work for Samsung. And so I moved from learning everything we talked about before, but the learning now about AI and chip design uh, and then applying that going forward with the work that I did at Facebook. And now a lot of the exploration work I've been doing here at Microsoft to date and my own consultancy minimalism. So that's how you how you apply that. You basically want to be ser serendipity is one thing, but that's like luck. Right. Yeah, there are inflections in time where you have the opportunity to work or be at or be brought into something, but you have to will that you have to make that happen and you can only do that by being creative. You have to be Zelda to burn that bush to find that hidden cave to blow up that rock to find that hidden door you've got it you've got to gamify your own exploration that is something i'd say. Love the reference to Zelda. <laughs> <Thank you back. laughs> but I, I think it, yeah, I mean, it probably has something to do also with you, you referenced previously, just like checking in with yourself and making space in your life to have those like free moments to think through, like, where am I? How am I doing? Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I have time for one more question. Um, so can you share your current practices around inclusive design and how that's influencing your work? Yeah, um, I mean, one is like, how do we how do we inherit and then further refine and grow a team? How do you build a team? You want to make sure if we talk about from the recruitment practice, you want to make sure that you're truly taking the time to slow down and ideally working with your partners to make sure that if there's a pressing need to hire someone getting a butt in a seat to make sure that you spend the time to do a diverse slate, you really want to recruit for a wide variety of diversity in the population and hire unique individuals into that into that role. Um, and by by doing that, then you have folks in your team and your org, right, you can then rift on it and sort of do that yes and be catalytic with your thinking and additive. Um, but also like when you're in these meetings where you're exploring, ideating, sketching, look around the table look around the room, look around at the pains in and surfaces in Zoom and on Teams and Meet and say like, who's not here? Who's not represented here? And if you don't happen to have them in your company, maybe bring them on as a consultant, uh, someone external, um, but be sure you also compensate them. Don't, don't have other people do the work, the emotional heavy lift for free. Always compensate people. Uh, because too often, like we've used, oh, but you're working for a big brand name, a company. That's not that's not appropriate. You need to make sure everyone's fairly compensated, for, no matter who they are. But that is one way you can really ensure that you're having an inclusive perspective. You're building diversely uh, and radically, um, you know, experience radical experiences that are basically representative of our changing planet uh, and, and the bodies and, and the folks around the world. Um, and doing that research is really important. That's that's what I would say to that question. Yeah, great. Okay, a lot. I think we have a couple more minutes. One more question here. Okay, <laughs> and this is associated, Let's right? Going. Let's just go until the questions Let's are done. Keep going, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one, just um, going sort of a quick level deeper into inclusion. Um, how, how are you reaching beyond the, the the usual candidates <laughs> to get greater representation. So like, do you have practices in place to ensure you have um, a broad range of representation within your teams? You really have to, you can't just post a job description to like Coraflat or Core 77 or whatnot, LinkedIn. It's like, you've got to like, it, you have to proactively build and start planning for your bench. Um, and you need to basically take, take stock be mindful about who's not there. Who do you want there? Uh, and then, you know, in in a in a truly altruistic sense, go off and like just start exploring who's out there. Talk to your friends in your communities. Recruit. Uh, plant those seeds early. Um, you know that candidate that you really would love to see join your team or your organization. 
um, get get those sort of enticements out there early and slowly start working on them. But but be genuine about it. Like, you know, check in with them, send them little gifts, be friendly. Uh, you know, be real. Uh, I think that's that's really critical. It takes a lot of hard work, and there's not a consultancy, there's not a platform or a service that can do that for you. Um, you really have to invest the time and effort, and you're gonna fail and not find a lot of people a lot of the time. But if you truly are sincere and you're showing that sincerity through over time that you really are making that investment, that's how you do it. Yeah. Fair. How about yourself? One, oh, like, what, like, what would you say about that question? That's a really good question. What are you yeah, all doing yeah. on that? Uh, well, I mean, I think, I think your, your comment about, to me, I think about like networking, which is sort of what, what you just described, right? It's like, who, who are you spending time with outside your day to day? Right. Yeah. Um, what, what events do you choose to, uh, to attend and, and how do you make connections at those events? How are you broadening your circle? Um, I mean, we, we have, there, there's sort of like, um, softer methods, like, like networking, Right. And then they're also uh, within Dropbox, we pay attention to um, like, what are the, what's the representation within the company? Right. Um, we pay attention to that. We make sure yeah. that, yeah, we make sure that uh, when we have rules open, we have a equal representation across the board. We're very, very mindful of pulling in a diverse range of candidates. Yeah. Um, Something that you all uh, done exceptionally well, and I have to like let everyone know this. I'm gonna slide off screen and grab something that's on my <laughs> wife's desk. Is uh, the feminist propaganda book that you all produced, uh, <laughs> ladies who yes. create? Like this is a really good example of you all actually show truly showing the world that you mean what you say. This is a fantastic Absolutely. reference. Yeah. You beat me to it because I was just about to bring up Ladies Who Create. <laughs> so we, we have groups, Ladies Who Create is, is the probabilist prominent one within Dropbox that um, try, we, we, we are very mindful about our, our programming and, and our OKR. Like we have a, a program with OKRs and like, we're serious about this. Yeah. Not only do we want to create opportunities within our company, but we create opportunities outside of our company, right? Um, to bring people together. Some, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this. Something I've seen other companies really do a poor job at is that they say, we want to basically create that representation. We want to open up sort of and have a diverse population inside of our, our culture and our organization, but they don't put the incentives behind truly changing that culture or changing that mindset. And I think it's like an OKR, but like if you put a financial monetary association to that, like you will not get your bonus. You will not you know, it's like to, to really, truly change the culture from within. I think that's something I'd love to see a lot more companies do, like really make an impact on the leadership to be held accountable for not hiring diverse slates. Um, that would be really awesome. Again, my own personal yeah. perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think it's always a work in progress, right? And we have really close partnership, um, partnership and, and training too. Training is important, like unconscious bias training, right? Like um, it's, all, it's all interconnected. So we have a really close relationship with our DEI group, um, with ladies who create um, and with leadership as a whole within Dropbox to make sure yeah. that dialogue is happening. Yeah. And then networking that you yeah. talked about too. Networking is like hard for introverts. All the introverts that are on, on this, uh, yeah. along this journey with us right now, virtually, it's like, it's hard to get up and go to like a meetup or to like a conference and sort of be able to mingle. Yeah. But some advice that I have for you all there is like, be, be authentic. Don't do it for want or need of something. Yeah. yeah like, and, and I, like, I, I really, I mean, I have this happen a lot. People walk up to me and they're like, I want to network with you, or I want to know about X, Y, and Z. And it's just like, I want to take, right. You want to be able yeah. to also be bi-directional and give, which is why I'm a huge proponent of sponsorship over, uh, over just mentoring, right? Um, you know, we should be invested in those that we mentor but in, and transform that into a bi-directional sponsorship of an individual. And, and if you're taking it from I, I want or a take and just a connecting game, got to collect them all Pokemon card, card, card experience, then that's, that's in, inauthentic. And I think we need to be authentic with how we network. Absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think uh, when I think about sort of the, the introverts or, or someone new to professional networking, um, I mean, I can imagine it might be a little bit intimidating. You're kind of like, I, what do I even talk to this person about? And maybe you just need to take a couple minutes to think about 
what's on my mind? I might have a question and it's totally fine to walk up and say, I'm curious about ML. <laughs> Absolutely. You interested yeah. in talking about it a little bit? <laughs> Can we have coffee? Yeah, like 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 do yeah. it or just like I want, but like let make it make an interaction. Let's get coffee or tea or like let's go for a walk. Yeah. 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 Just uh let's let's talk about something. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Anna, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everyone got as much joy and value out of out of this discussion I got. Um, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful holiday. I hope you get to rest and recharge. Um, yeah. and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you all for joining. This has been really wonderful. Nicole and Deepa and Michelle and Haley, thanks again for having me here. Um, it's a huge honor to follow in Rachel's footsteps with who you had her recently. And uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful inspiration to me as well. So thank you all. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.